Okay, um, I think we'll all get started now. So um, I, can everybody hear me all right? Um, great. So hello everybody. Welcome all to a very special event that we have today put on by the No Cold War International Campaign. My name is Sean Kong and I'm speaking on behalf of the Chow Collective today as well as chairing this event. The Chow Collective is a group of Chinese diaspora writers, artists, and researchers dedicated to anti-imperialism and socialism. We are a media collective dedicated to challenging US aggression on China, which we hold as fueled and justified using nakedly racist and Sinophobic tropes. We are definitely a recent arrival to the anti-war and anti-racist movements compared to some of the eminent speakers we have lined up here today. We are actually just a few months shy of Chow Collective's first anniversary of its founding in January of this year in response to the virulently racist and imperialist narratives surrounding the first documented COVID-19 cluster in Wuhan and the broader Sinophobic Cold War agenda, which language such as the China virus served to intensify. The short 10 months since our founding has witnessed historic escalation on the part of the United States in its efforts to contain and destabilize China's peaceful rise. Amidst events such as the forced closure in July of the Chinese consulate in Houston, new rounds of sanctions on Chinese officials and companies in an all-out information war against China on topics as wide-ranging as Hong Kong and the environment, Chow Collective has tried to play a small role in providing media, analysis, and commentary that provides a counter-narrative to rising anti-China hysteria in the United States and beyond. In our endeavors, Chow Collective has been honored to have the support and collaboration of our longtime peace advocates, anti-imperialists, and other comrades in, in, in particular, the new Co No Cold War Organizing Committee on which we have been honored to serve. I would like to thank the No Cold War Organizing Committee for allowing us this honor of chairing today's meeting. Today's event is about linking anti-racism racism activism with anti-war movements. While it might at first be difficult to connect racism, a concept many of us are conditioned to believe is largely an interpersonal phenomenon with imp imperialism and warfare, which have global implications, such a connection is in fact only quite natural when considering countries whose entire territorial jurisdictions are built on conquest justified with racist ideologies and who possess entire systems of law built on racist doctrines to legitimize their conquests. In my own country, the United States, founded in no small part by the wish of colonial imperialists to gain spectacular wealth through speculation on then yet conquered indigenous land, Settler land rights do not exist independent of the basic assumption that indigenous peoples have no rights. And historically, an entire class of people were individually considered three-fifths of a person. This past year has clarified the endurance of these systems of white supremacy and the structures of capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism that they uphold. The COVID-19 pandemic in the United States has had decidedly unequal impacts with native nations such as the Navajo Nation and many black communities facing disproportionate fatality rates. Amidst the staggering so-called third wave of cases reaching historic heights, the United States has merely sought to shift the blame for these disparities and contradictions onto China with the racialized language of the so-called China plague or Wuhan virus. This crude orientalism alongside false claims of a Chinese cover-up are merely attempts to project a crisis manufactured by American capitalism and white supremacy onto an oriental villain. In the face of US unilateralism and belligerence during the COVID-19 crisis, the No Cold War International Campaign is dedicated to resisting needless conflict in an era requiring global human cooperation. In the face of unprecedented problems such as climate change, global pandemic preparedness, and the fight against hunger and poverty. Indeed, the very term Cold War is in itself an indication of its own imperial core biases fueled by racism, as the Cold War was anything but conflict-free with millions of human lives and futures lost and stolen by the Cold War's conflicts and strife, the cost borne the most by peoples and nations of the global South. What some may call Pax Americana starting from the 1990s, others rightfully see as unacceptable acquiescence to a global order which treats the misery and suffering of people and children as, in the words of former Secretary of State and recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Madeleine Albright, worth it. Indeed, this is a global order very much justified by racist ideologies and reliant on the callous degrading and dehumanization of fellow people. But I'm confident that the speakers we have today reporting in from and re representing communities from all over the globe can speak much more to these experiences, both universal and particular. This is far and away one of the most exciting panels I have ever encountered. 
And each speaker has been on my personal, wow, this person would be cool to talk to for two seconds list. So please pardon me if I prove a bit exuberant while introducing each speaker. Speakers, please note that you have eight minutes. I will unfortunately need to start cutting off people once time has been reached. Uh, but with that, let us waste no more time and get to the exciting conversations we'll have to today. Um, so our first speaker coming up is Danny Haifong. Danny Haifong is a socialist activist, writer, and political analyst. He's a weekly contributor to Black Agenda Report um, um, and a member of the No Cold War Organizing Committee and the author of American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, a people's history of fake news from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. Danny's work has been instrumental in bringing this extraordinary panel around. So Danny, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Sean. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us to condemn the racism inherent in the US's new Cold War on China. From its inception, racism has been a critical force in the development of US capitalism and imperialism. We cannot speak of racism without remembering how the enslavement of Africans and the colonization of indigenous peoples form the roots of US economic, military, and political development. We also cannot speak of racism as an ideology and system confined to national boundaries. Racism has always been an international phenomenon. Cold War politics and racism are connected by their shared vision of preserving the power and hegemony of one system of development over another. During the first Cold War, the United States was ascending as a superpower at the same time that capitalism was descending as a legitimate economic model of development. Cold War anti-communism sought to delegitimize mass movements for social and political transformation wherever they emerged. In the US, the most vibrant political movement has always been the struggle for the human rights of black Americans and other social groups terrorized by racism. Black freedom organizations such as the NAACP and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were routinely targeted as communist plots and repressed by all forms of law enforcement. The rise of New China in 1949 intensified the US's Cold War abroad. US military strategists lamented over the quote unquote loss to China to communism. The US swiftly placed economic and diplomatic sanctions on the newly formed People's Republic of China. The US invaded Korea in 1950 and renewed Yellow Peril racism in the United States, which placed US military forces and the People's Liberation Army in direct conflict with each other. US forces would go on to murder more than 2 million Korean civilians, including scores of Chinese forces fighting by their side. During this period, racism provided cover for the use of napalm and other weapons of mass destruction and helped erase the war from the American psyche. While the people of Korea and China see the war as a pivotal moment in their history, the US calls its own participation in the war, the quote unquote forgotten war to this very day. Not everyone in the United States, however, agreed with US hostilities toward China during the first Cold War. Black American activists in particular took a strong stance against US aggression in Asia and saw the struggle for new China as a source of inspiration for their own cause of freedom. In a poem, black activist Claudia Jones wrote of China, quote, no idle dreamers these, and yet they dare to dream. The dream long planned unfolds in socialist China. In 1959, black scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois described China in a speech he gave at Peking University as, quote, the most populous nation on this ancient earth, which has burst its shackles, not by boasting and strutting, not by lying about its history and its conquests, but by patience and long suffering, by blind struggle, moved up and onward toward the crimson sky. Du Bois and Jones were not isolated in the opinion that China's successful revolution to end its century of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers was intimately connected to the centuries of racist humiliation endured by blacks in the United States. China was viewed by many black movement activists as a political and ideological place of refuge from the threat of white imperial rule. NAACP activist Robert Williams fled to China after being driven out of the country by white vigilantes and law enforcement. The Black Panther Party visited China twice before Richard Nixon eventually made the trip that led to the normalization of relations between the two countries. 
that black freedom fighters contributed immensely to a politics of internationalism and friendship with countries such as China remains relevant in this dangerous period for US-China relations. A new Cold War on China has emerged in recent years, and it is once again led by the United States. The first Cold War utilized racism to justify the dehumanization of countries and peoples choosing their own path to independence. The new Cold War on China employs the same logic in a period when the US in its model of unipolar dominance is in a process of decline and crisis. China's rise as an economic superpower an influential force in the areas of poverty alleviation, ecological sustainability, and respect for international law has been deemed a threat to the US's primacy. This has led to a host of hostile policies that include the military encirclement of China, the sanctioning of its tech corporations, a blatant interference in China's internal affairs, and a nonstop demonization campaign surrounding China's pandemic response. Anti-China racism forms a skeleton of the new Cold War on China in its entirety. China and its people have been returned to the position of quote unquote red menace in the eyes of many Americans to add to the host of other racist stereotypes that have shaped US thinking about China for more than a century. The internationalism that black freedom activists and their allies expressed during the first Cold War provide numerous lessons for those who hope to build a world defined by peace and a respect for self-determination. Internationalism is first and foremost a project that humanizes those who have been dehumanized. Black freedom activists affirm the humanity of the Chinese people and people all over the world as a critical step in devising a joint vision of a planet free from war, racism, and want. Their example demonstrates what it means to stand up for principles of justice, liberation, and peace for all people who have ever been deprived of them. Internationalism is not merely a rejection of war, but a rejection of the racist ideas that fuel war. It is a conscious decision to stand up for the truth buried underneath Cold War politics. And the truth is that China is rising just as it was during the first Cold War. This time, however, China is rising not merely out of colonial underdevelopment, but into a position of global leadership itself. China's economy will surpass the US's in less than a decade and do so on its own terms. Rather than colonize, occupy, and plunder other countries, China has built a truly globalized planned economy, which offers an example to the global South of how prosperity and people-centered development can exist at the same time. The first Cold War brought the world tremendous challenges, but also offered opportunities for anti-racist forces to build ties of solidarity with nations such as China rising out of colonialism and foreign domination. Similar opportunities exist now in the era of the new Cold War. But history must be our guide to truly unite the danger against the dangerous course laid by the United States. History shows that racism and war are not defeated with denunciations alone, but rather by the action humanity takes to foster peaceful relations in the real world. To truly reject racism, anti-racist and anti-war movements must adopt the approach of modeling what peaceful relations look like in the here and now. That means both denouncing the new Cold War and extending a hand of friendship to China in its pursuit of a global order defined by cooperation in international law instead of aggression in racial domination. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Danny. Our next speaker is Loki. Loki is an acclaimed British Iraqi rapper and political activist. He has performed in Venezuela at the request of Hugo Chavez and toured refugee camps in the West Bank and has been a prominent member of Stop the World Coalition. Throughout his prolific career, he has never shied away from centering anti-war advocacy in his work in politics and we're very honored to have him join us today. Thank you for that amazing introduction. It's an honor to be here among you. Firstly, it's important to establish the position from which I speak. In 1600, when the East India Company was founded, Britain produced only 1.8% of world GDP. India and China, on the other hand, if we look at 1750, they still produce 75% of the world's industrial output. Between 1750 and 1900, 
per capita GDP increased by 347%. In this relatively short period of human history, economic power was concentrated in a small part of the world's population. But that concentration of power in such a small amount of people is the aberration of history rather than the mainstay. We see clearly that Britain's industrialization and development was based on the de-development successfully and the attempted de-development of many other societies. Adam Smith pointed it out that in the 18th century, China had a far more sophisticated and developed market than those in Europe. In fact, when the Chinese would have first come across those from Europe, it wouldn't be a surprise if they perceived them to be far less um, closer, could you say, to barbarians, in fact, in the way that they arranged their affairs. When talking about China, you're talking about one-fifth of the world's population. It's 1.4 billion human beings. It is the longest still existing polity or political unit, at least 2,000 years, a civilization which spans four to 5,000 years. There are those that argue the Fertile Crescent um, was the first settled agriculture in the world. And historians have pointed to four to five periods of Chinese history where they were the most advanced entity. It had steel production a millennium and a half before England. It had printed press half a millennium before England. We know that Cheng Ho, and I apologize for the pronunciation, sailed the globe um, in far more advanced ships long before de Gama and Columbus. You had the seeds of meritocratic society in the Confucian exam system thousands of years before it was being discussed in this part of the world. When we talk about racism towards Chinese people in the United States, for example, it has to be placed along a trajectory which shows us the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. At the same point when the Statue of Liberty was being built Chinese people were being deported from the United States and banned from entering. And in fact, there were killings of Chinese workers during that period of time. We think about Forbes, Forbes magazine, that great symbol of US capitalism. But what is the irony in 2011 of Forbes magazine publishing an article titled China's Secret Weakness, referring to opium addiction? When, of course, we know that Forbes family themselves obtained their great wealth through the selling of opium within China that was enforced by the British Opium Wars. During the same period, the U.S. were able to carve out what they referred to as New Chinas, little New Chinas, heavily Christianized and heavily Western areas such as Hong Kong. If we look at the the period of time from 1978 to now, you had the Chinese economy being worth about 5% of the US economy and 80% of China still living in poverty. At that time, the developed world accounted for two thirds of the world economy and the developing world only a third, roughly, despite having 85% of the group's population. Over the next 30 years, you saw on average the Chinese economy grow by 10% a year. We are at a stage now where the 20 fastest growing economies in the world, not one of them is European, and several of them are former British colonies. Now, by becoming the number one exporter and manufacturing power in the world, China lifted between 750 million and 800 million people out of poverty. During that period of time, you are talking about two thirds of global poverty reduction. And it's been projected by many that by 2030, China will uh, possess one third of the world's economy. Um, there are those that project it would be twice the size of the US economy by that stage and larger than the US and European economy put 
together. Even if you look at the China Development Bank and the China Export Import Bank, they have given more loans to countries in the global south than the World Bank as of today. Um, and the question is that as a country which has huge human resources, but relatively tiny natural resources and one fifth as much water as the United States has 8% of the world's cultivated land, which has to feed 22% of the world's population, what China has achieved is nothing short of miraculous. One of the lines which people often aim at China is the carbon emissions. So while they overtook the United States in 2007, the emissions per capita are still one seventh of the US carbon emissions. And in fact, over the last 40 years, the extent of China's um, effect on climate change has been one sixth of that of the United States. But what also is important to note is that 40% of China's energy consumption comes from producing goods for Western markets. So it is in that way that a lot of Western companies have been able to export their carbon emissions. Studies looking at 15 uh, major pandemics in Europe from the Black Death to the 1918 um, Spanish flu. And of course the Black Death wiped out, is believed to have wiped out half of Europe's, Europe's population, is that the economies were depressed um, in terms of investment between 30 and 50 years following those outbreaks. Now, the question is this. In the United States, one of the things credited with lifting them out of the Great Depression was World War II, because it provided jobs for people through the army. It provided um, jobs for people in terms of weapons manufacturing. Another point about the Black Death is that it led to a huge rise in anti-Semitism and an in innovation in ways that so-called plague spreaders could be targeted within um, European society, focusing also on so-called witches. Now, what we are in danger of is a combination of this thinking that the United States will be able to lift itself out of its predicament through war and the natural development of human history to a more equal distribution of economic power, but also that the racism that this pandemic will give um, a boost to will be directed in that way. And there is no doubt that the military industrial complex, that the ghouls from organizations like the Atlantic Council, Henry Jackson Society, the 77th Brigade among them will be looking to turn this into a way to scapegoat China. Now, how will Britain deal with the United States that is pushing for war with China? Well, the reality is that Britain exports more to Ireland than it does to all of the BRICS nations combined. You're talking about a society where 62% of the population can only speak English and 34% of the population think it would be good if the British Empire still exist, existed. By pinning themselves to this orthodoxy um, and this projection of some sort of Anglo-Saxon power around the world, Britain are going against the natural movement of history. China is currently surrounded by 400 US military bases. And I would say that the US would do well to remember, as Danny pointed to, the 56,000 US soldiers that died in Korea and the 58,000 that were lost in Vietnam. The world is not with the United States. It is more isolated than it has ever been. The international community, especially on the subject of China, means nothing anymore, even within the Five Eyes network, which uh, the United States has had to rely on. Who is the largest trading partner for Australia? It's China. Even other allies like India that the United States may rely on to use as a proxy against China um, 
their largest trading partner um, is also uh, China. Brazil's largest trading partner is China. We're talking about um, having been for 110 years, the United States, the world's largest exporter has been replaced by um, China. And that's not something that the rest of the world has a huge amount of problem with. If you look at the Belt and Road Initiative and the 70 countries um, uh, that are involved in that, you look at the 16 uh, plus uh, initiative with the Central um, uh, European States, even Greece and Italy are becoming closer to, um, to, to China. I so so really, much, but, uh, most of can Europe- you Wrapping things up, thank you so much. Okay, I will wrap up right now. So the rest of Europe, the rest of Europe does not see the same world that the United States sees. And what we have to be careful of in Britain is that the uh, sending of Obama here as the US ambassador will be linked to trying to force Britain to become more warlike towards China. Let's not forget that it was Obama trying to push TPP. And that was about China. So we're at a situation now where if Britain doesn't want to be completely isolated in the way that the United States is, then it will have to change its policy and divert from that route. Thank you again so much. Uh, our next speaker is Li Jingjing. Uh, Li Jingjing is a Chinese journalist and host of CGTN's Talk It Out with Jingjing Li, an English language program highlighting Chinese life, culture, and politics. Jingjing has been very active lately in reaching out to the West and communicating the story of China to the world. I can say personally that I have really enjoyed her blog, vlogs and coverage of the diverse peoples of China, including the Tibetans and the Jingpo people. Jingjing, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you all. Um, as a Chinese, I really thank you guys for um, what you said about China. And of course, as a journalist, I spent a lot of time traveling across China, visiting people of different ethnic groups, trying to let more people know about their culture, understand their customs. And um, I think when talking about Chinese nation, it's actually a very broad concept because, because that refers to 56 different ethnic groups living in China for thousands of years. Among the 56, the majority is the Han Chinese, like I am, I'm a Han Chinese, uh, that make up the 90% of the population in China. And the other 55 different ethnic groups make up the, uh, the rest 10%. That's why because of the number of populations, we call the 55 as ethnic minority groups. So I think not many people out of, outside of China actually realize there are so many different ethnicities living in China until very recently, some government, some media trying to create a racial conflict in China. Like uh, the, the talk about those Uyghur issues or in Xinjiang or Tibetan issues. Until recently, they suddenly care about a certain group of ethnic groups in China. So, and I noticed there are some narratives that these people tend to push, push were basically saying those ethnic groups culture and language are being wiped out. Their mosques, their temples are being destroyed or uh, those people are being used as forced labor. And I think those people who are fabricating those fictions uh, either don't understand Chinese or don't bother to dig out in the Chinese world because that basically legally impossible to do in China because there were so many laws, so many uh, so many policies actually to protect and promote different ethnic groups culture. And here I would like to share with you some China's real policies towards those uh, different ethnic groups, but especially to, towards the minorities. And for you, first I would like to start with the constitution. Actually, anyone can look it up. The four, article four of the constitution specifically says, all races in China are created equal, of course, and eth every ethnic group's rights, legal rights and benefits are protected by the law. And actually any racism uh, or oppression against any ethnic group is prohibited. And any activities trying to separate all those eth ethnic groups are prohibited. And also um, it's the government's responsibility to develop their economy and the cultural 
of different ethnic groups based on their characteristics and their needs. And, it's, and there's another rule that is very important in China is actually the, this uh, regional autonomy. Uh, for example, the place I'm, I'm staying right now is called Guangxi Zhuang ethnic, um, autonomy, Zhuang autonomy region because the majority is the Zhuang ethnic group. And Xinjiang, many people heard about Xinjiang, but the full name of Xinjiang is actually Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So actually in China, different ethnic groups, uh, they have this autonomy in their region. And there are three levels of autonomy. Uh, autonomy region is like provincial level. And under this provincial level, there are also pre uh, autonomy prefecture, autonomy county, and actually autonomy villages that give us those people rights to govern themselves based on their traditions, their cultures. So, and also it comes to the second law is actually called this uh, regional autonomy law. And there are so many things listed very specifically how to protect their culture, how to boost their language and how to protect their religious freedom. So, and I can, I can list the three, point out of three, for example, the, uh, article 21st, it says, um, it tells all the government officials that they have to use their region's uh, ethnic group's language to, to work with the local people. And in some language, in some region, there were the prevalent language, there are several prevalent languages because different ethnic groups live in one region. For example, Xinjiang province, people only know about Uyghur people living in Xinjiang. But actually in Xinjiang, there were 55 ethnic groups living in Xinjiang. Remember, there were 56 ethnic groups of all China, uh, among all Chinese, there were 56 ethnic groups, but just in Xinjiang, there are 55. But the Uyghurs are the majority of the minorities. So they govern that region. And of course, um, many people, the, among the national language Mandarin that I tend to speak, uh, also there are the Uyghur language is also a prevalent language. So the local government officials actually are able to speak several different languages. Um, that's the original law and also uh, in the second, in the 22nd article of this original autonomy law, it also specifically listed that government, local government should give a priority to hire people of men, ethnic minorities and especially to hire women and children of ethnic minorities and to provide training skills uh, no matter it's science or any skills for ethnic minorities to make sure they have, they have more opportunities to work on different levels. And also there's another lie that uh, ten pe those people who try to create, create racial war in China, they tend to say they're, all the languages are being wiped out. Well, of course, if you come to China, you actually go to Xinjiang or Tibet or in the Mongolia, you will immediately realize those are <laughs> so they're false because there are uh, signs, road signs of their language. Everybody is talking their own languages. It's so easy to debunk their lies. But also, if you take a look at the law, the education law, it specifically says in all schools, especially in this region, uh, autonomy regions, it's mandatory to teach at least two languages. One is the national language, Mandarin, and uh, the other language, is basically on which ethnic, ethnic group is the majority there. I remember in September, I visited Tibet um, because so many people are saying Tibetan languages no longer, no longer exist. So actually I visited one of the local schools in the county. Um, almost all the students at that school is Tibetan kids. Uh, some because it's a small county in the middle of a quite a remote area, but sometimes there were students of other ethnic groups. But uh, not only they all uh, speak Tibetan at home or to each other, there are also Tibetan class teach them how to to make great literature, to write poems in Tibetan class in uh, this Tibetan class. So. It's mandatory. And even if the students are Han Chinese or of other ethnic groups, they have to take this Tibetan class. It's mandatory for everyone. So these are the basic laws to promote the different languages and cultures of ethnic groups. Ethnic groups. Now also just last month, I visited the Yunnan province, another re a region with so many diverse ethnic groups. 
And there's a one group is called a bi-ethnic group. And their language is, they only have spoken language. They don't have words. So even with such a language that have no words, they're still able to pass this language from generations to generations. And they speak, they speak that language in the, at their school, at home. And um, there's some, um, I actually I talked to one of the locals. Uh, okay, so, so because there were also other lang uh, ethnic groups living in that region like Yi minority and the Li Su minority. So how do they communicate with the Bai who makes up the majority? Actually, other ethnic groups also learn by language in, be, in order to be able to communi communicate with the majority of the people. So in those regions, regardless of your ethnic groups, they are really uh, learning each other's language. And in this Chinese law, in this original autonomy law, uh, there's one article specifically listed that they're encouraging our government officials to learn each other's languages, no matter uh, what race you are, learn each other's language. And those who are able to speak at least three languages will get a special bonus. So, well, if they really dig out about Chinese law, they will know uh, those uh, people who are trying, really trying to push forward the free Xinjiang, free Tibet, um, their, their narratives is just so easy to debunk. And also, there's another thing, um, and, and I think people tend to say they are really wiping out this population. For example, in the past few months, some experts suddenly say that they're sterilizing the Uyghur women and the Uyghur people are really being oppressed. But in fact, the population, there's a number, according to the six national demographic census, um, the Uyghur population by in 20, 2010, it's 10 million. But in the year 1953, the number was only 3.6 million. So over the past few decades, Uyghur population increased like almost tripled. So I don't know which oppressor in the world will oppress another race by boosting their population. So if you do a little more research, check about this uh, information, you will realize, well, some felt some, they didn't really care about to dig out the real figures in China. And also there's one uh, child policy. The time is, the time yeah. is running, so. Uh... Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, another thing is um, maybe the one also the one child policy it actually only applies to Han people. Uh, for example, uh, it's long been disputed, but actually only Han people can uh, use one child policy. People of other ethnic groups can have two or three kids. So all these different ethnic ethnic minorities, their populations have doubled and tripled over the past few decades. And, uh, and also uh, I want to talk about this, uh, that they are demolishing the mosques and uh, temples. Actually now in Tibet, there were like oh, 1,700 Tibetan temples and with four, oh, 46,000 um, nuns and monks. And in Tibet, there are the monks, uh, the uh, sorry, the mosques were about 23,000. 23,000 mosques. I don't know how many mosques are there in the US. Danny, are you about to say something? Sorry. I might like keep, okay. How much time I have left, I'm not sure. And um, so- um, just, wrap up, just wrap up and we'll, uh, we'll head on to the next speaker. Okay, cool. So um, there were so many different ethnic groups living in China, but there were so many laws specifically uh, listed the equality of different ethnic groups and trying to put, to make sure each culture and uh, each language can be inherited. And also this year, uh, there were so many different ethnic groups being lifted out of poverty. And um, what I really, I think what people keep saying how to create uh, this, uh, how to remove racism, I think is give the opportunity for everyone to get out of poverty give everyone the chance to live a better life. And this is the most and the most important, the most basic human rights. And that is what's being done in China very well. So anyone, for anyone who really curious about what the risk going on, ethnic groups really is, the situation really is in China. 
come here to take a look at China and go to those regions or just take a look at those, uh, dig, dig more, dig more into the just Chinese world. Okay? Is that okay? <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, MP Diane Abbott, are you, are you there? Uh, looks like she's still um, uh, logging on. So uh, for our next speaker, um, we have here Kale Holmes. Kale Holmes is an American journalist based in Beijing who has written for outlets such as CGTN, Mint, Prince, Mint Press News, and RT on US-China relations in a recent escalation of US aggression on China. His voice comes at a time of a sharp ramp up in the intensity of the information war against China. And his consistent calls for mutual understanding are welcome in these increasingly xenophobic times. It's therefore a pleasure to have him here with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here as well. I, um, I came here to China a year ago and when I came, it was a very already tense situation before uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has even uh, been used by you know, the United States government, the Trump administration to ratchet tensions up further. When I was flying from Detroit to Beijing, you know, the Customs and Border Patrol agents were you know, very sternly uh, asking a lot of Chinese nationals returning questions about you know, their travels. I was even questioned about what I was bringing to China. This whole kind of Cold War environment has uh, been going on for a while now. And the trade war was one, man, one manifestation. Um, and this actually speaks, uh, this all goes to what a lot of the speakers have spoken about. You know, this goes back to uh, questions of U.S. hegemony. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the reasons that the Nixon administration wrote out, uh, reached out to China back in the 70s had a lot to do with uh, its anti-Soviet policy. So the China was viewed uh, due to the Sino-Soviet split um, as a potential uh, you know, regional power to uh, take advantage of uh, the USSR. And that was the main goal of the Nixon administration when it uh, was dealing with um, uh, Chairman Mao and was dealing with Zhou Enlai. And one of the uh, outcomes of the US-China relationship uh, was that you know, China uh, was finally admitted back into the world economy, and uh, it was there was a reversal that happened. Not many people know that we were actually in a worse place, perhaps, uh, in the 1950s than we are now. And it can get there, and it's very frightening. And people ought to know, you know, back during the 1950s, the China hands were purged. Um, you know, people like uh, you know John Service, people who were sympathetic to the Chinese Revolution, who worked for the State Department, uh, were all sidelined and marginalized. And uh, that legacy is happening now again. Now, the reasons I think we all know are clear and has a lot to do with uh, after the fact, the USSR um, dissolved in 1991, uh, China's uh, you know, use for the United States and imperial interests became uh, less and less uh, clear. And one of, you know, during the 1990s, we already saw the United States ratcheting up uh, tensions with China. You know, there was the third Taiwan Strait crisis when, uh, you know, U.S. naval uh, ships were uh, going to Taiwan province. You had the, uh, you know, the bombing of the U.S., or sorry, the Chinese embassy rather in Belgrade. Um, and the uh, spy plane during the Bush administration that was, uh, you know, uh, caught in China. And, all of this uh, has been, you know, very rooted in the fact that China, uh, it's an independent power. It's, you know, trying to um, rise peacefully. And it's not, it doesn't really answer to Washington. You know, Beijing uh, is serving the, you know, its own people, you know, regardless of what Goldman Sachs wants, regardless of what uh, people who expected that China would become a kind of neoliberal economy, you know, that uh, never happened. And quite frankly, it's uh, interesting to see that the Chinese consul in Chengdu, which uh, Vice President Bush Sr. actually had so much influence in opening, uh, you know, that of course was closed after the United States closed the U.S. consulate in, uh, the, sorry, the 
to, after the United States closed the Chinese consulate in Houston. And this, uh, these tensions have real effects on real people. You know, uh, my professor in college, you know, way back before the Trump administration even came into office during the pivot to Asia, so to speak, you know, she was asked by her dentist, was she a, you know, Chinese communist spy? And, uh, you know, the Trump administration and Mike Pompeo uh, kind of dealing in a lot of the uh, dog whistling, dog whistle words against Chinese people has made things worse. You know, hate crimes have risen. Uh, people in the healthcare industry who are Asian Americans have been targeted or, you know, experienced racial discrimination. And uh, what this does is it makes uh, it's that much more likely that there could be conflict and it makes it that much more acceptable uh, or palatable to the American consciousness to get into military engagement with China, which would be very dangerous for the world. Um, and I think, you know, China has actually, you know, responded to the, the situation that's at hand in a way that I think the United States uh, and people should be watching very quickly you know, clearly and learning from, because, you know, when Trump pulled out of the World Health Organization, China was very keen on continuing cooperation. You know, China's even been cooperating with Brazil and uh, Indonesia, countries that don't even necessarily, um, and sometimes as, we, as we've seen with Bolsonaro, uh, uh, rejecting the COVID-19 vaccine, countries that sometimes run up or, you know, buck against China's uh, diplomacy, but still China has been very active in trying to urge international cooperation, free of racial discrimination. You know, they've uh, helped Iran, you know, uh, with its COVID-19 response, you know, despite the U.S. sanctions preventing medicine from getting to Iran. Uh, and China has been very active in helping a lot of African health experts, you know, with various Zoom conferences, just like this one, learn the uh, uh, policies that Wuhan did to treat the COVID-19 crisis. And I think, you know, that response actually shows us a world that, that could happen. And I think that's something that's very uh, uh, optimistic if we, you know, have the responsibility to fight against, uh, you know, very troubling developments, like, like what's happening with, you know, the Trump administration uh, sanctioning American investors from doing business with Chinese tech companies, sneaky Asian stereotype about, you know, where China is doing with WeChat or how they're trying to sneak uh, this or that, or, you know, the conspiracy theories about the lab, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic being made in a lab, all these, uh, you know, racist uh, disinformation campaigns that have a root in the yellow peril, uh, you know, stereotypes of the early 20th century, is we have a responsibility to fight these uh, tragic developments. We also have something to look forward to, which is a world of international cooperation. You know, there's lots to uh, cheer on. And I think it's uh, really, uh, it's good that we're having this discussion and we're talking to people about what needs to be what needs to happen for us to effectively fight the new cold war of china thank you so much kale okay. thank you our next speaker is um mp diane abbott diane abbott is a labor member of parliament representing hackney north and stoke newington since 1987 when she became the first black woman elected to parliament she has been a key figure in efforts to push labor to the left serving as Jeremy Corbyn's shadow home secretary from 2016 to 2020. In parliament, she's been a staunch critic of foreign intervention, consistently opposing the Iraq war and adventurism in the Middle East and beyond. It is my distinct pleasure to give the floor to Diane Abbott. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me? Lo oh, loud and clear. Very good. Um, well, I'm very pleased to be speaking at this in important meeting and I do feel strongly that the global north if you like Western Europe America should not slide back into a new cold war with China 
as its epicenter. Um, it, it's also important that we continue to combat racism. But I have to say that in this country, here in, in Britain, there is a report of a very steep rise in anti-Chinese racism or xenophobia. Of course, racists being who they are, they don't distinguish much between those who are ethnically Chinese or Japanese or Korean, but there is a rise in general xenophobia. And of course, that has been stoked by the United States under Trump. Um, it was remarkable how he insisted in calling the coronavirus the Chinese virus. And it is remarkable how he has promulgated a message, an anti-Chinese message. He's trying to convince um, workers in what they call the post-industrial states in the Midwest, people in manufacturing and mining and steel and so on, that their jobs have been taken from them by the Chinese and in quotes unquote, standing up to the Chinese, he is standing up for these workers who have lost their job. Fortunately, with the recent presidential election and the falling off of support for President Trump, it does seem that people are slightly more skeptical um, about his message. Um, but we have to hope that with Biden as president, he will adopt less China baiting, more positive, more globalized. I should also say that here in Britain, in addition to the, the vile and long-standing racism against black people, against Muslims, against Jews, we also have anti-Chinese racism. And we know this, there are some indicators of this. Um, one research group has found that reported hate crime directed at Britain's East Asian communities went up three times, 300% in the first quarter of this year. Research, always, research also says that this year, the global use of hashtags on Twitter, encouraging violence against China and Chinese people has gone up nine times, 900%. And research also shows that we're seeing twice the increase on Twitter and Facebook and so on in global traffic to hate sites and specific posts against Asians. These are shockingly high rates of growth, but we also see scarcely less um, aggressive attacks on Chinese people and China in our media. This is not just about the virus or Huawei. This is about beating the drums of this new Cold War. It is about all of these factors and the terrible effects that we see on social media and the streets is partly the, the message that people are seeing in mainstream media. So I think this meeting is very important. I think it's very important that we fight racism in general, that we fight anti-Chinese racism, and that we make our leaders aware that we don't want to fall back into the um, inward-looking, xenophobic, politics of Trump or even his his uh, his friend the uh, Prime Minister of Britain um, and generally one of the things that's come out of the US presidential election was the importance of the votes of black people people of color and the daughters and sons of migrants they were decisive in winning the election for Biden. We saw in Philadelphia, where the black communities in Pennsylvania 
brought home Philadelphia as a state in terms of the numbers of votes for Biden. Latino communities in places like Arizona also delivered for Biden. There was an issue with Cuban exiles in Florida, but overall, Latino communities, the majority of them voted for Biden. And we've seen a rise in progressive politics in the United States. There are now 18 uh, congressmen and women who call themselves democratic socialists. And the squad, which is a group of mainly young progressive women in color, continues to grow. There are people saying that the Democratic parties in Congress and the failure to win the Senate is because it was too associated with radicalism, with socialism, with the Green New Deal, and above all with Black Lives Matter. This is simply not true. The exit polls show that Black Lives Matter was far more popular um, with the American electorate than either Trump or Biden. Black Lives Matter had 57% of the public and just 36 against. These are remarkable figures when you, when you realize how much black lives matter has been demonized. So we want to reject racism generally. We want to understand that movements like black lives matter, not just in America, but all over the world are an important driver of politics and progressive politics. Um, the, the demonization of people of color and of Chinese people is really a way in which politicians like Trump and Boris Johnson try and pander to a certain section of the electorate. So I'm pleased to speak at this meeting. It's really important that we all stand up against the onset of a new Cold War. It looks as if uh, Donald Trump is going before too long to concede the presidential election, which he actually has lost. Here in Britain, Boris Johnson is going through any amount of turmoil. We have to reject the right. We have to reject politicians that stir up racism and xenophobia. We have to gather and move forward against the new Cold War and towards a globalised and progressive world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, MP Diane Abbott. Our next speaker is David West. David West is a retired basketball player, a two-time NBA All-Star and political activist, after a 15 year career in the NBA, West retired in 2018 and since then has been an important anti-war voice critical of US imperialism. In July of 2020, during a peak in anti-China rhetoric and NBA debates about player support for the Hong Kong protests, West gave an important interview with Black Agenda Report criticizing what he called foreign policy warmongers who pushed misleading narratives about China in the mainstream media. David West has been very kind to leave to pre-record a statement for us and we'll give it a listen now. In peace, uh, first of all, I'm honored and humbled by the opportunity to contribute to the Uniting Against Racism and the New Cold War online panel discussion today. I want to thank Rainy Haifang for extending the invitation. In peace, uh, first of all, I'm honored and humbled by the opportunity to contribute to the Uniting Against Racism and the New Cold War online panel discussion today. I wanna to thank Danny Haifang for extending the invitation and thinking enough of me to ask for my input in the discussion. To the other distinguished contributors, many of whom I personally admire, I am thankful for your work and contributions made in the promotion of peace and justice initiatives throughout the world. We want peace. The year 2020 has seen the world struck still by a global pandemic. No population of people on the planet has gone unaffected by COVID-19. 
Equally, all nations have been hit with varying levels of the virus, some experiencing greater levels of severity than others. In the US, the response has been abysmal. The fallacy of having a society centered on profits in all aspects of life has cost thousands of people their lives. The coronavirus has exposed how ill-prepared a hyper-capitalist nation such as the United States is to handle a serious public health crisis. It has truly been astonishing to witness the ineffective leadership, the mixed messaging from the media, and the refusal of certain citizens to perform a simple act of public safety by wearing a mask. The global response has been quite a different story. Nations like China, Senegal, and New Zealand all quickly organized around controlling the spread of the virus because the central concern was the health of its people. We saw countries who prioritized the well-being of their citizens move swiftly to contain and address the needs of their people in a moment of crisis. We witnessed Cuba and China sharing medical experts and their associated expertise with nations who sought help in combating the virus. Nations such as those mentioned and many others see a shared future in the world. Combating illness and infectious diseases aligns most sensible nations in a collective call to action. On this accord, nations have found ways to work together and build relationships that are fortified by the common interests of the greater good. It is in this spirit we stand against the new Cold War. Those of us who are organized by peace and seek justice in our lives and those of our fellow citizens stand in solidarity. As a global community, we have shared interests more than ever before. With the impending climate catastrophe, endless wars, COVID-19, coupled with uh, global homelessness and poverty yet to be eradicated, the world community now, more than ever, must work together to ensure humanity survives. Unfortunately, the United States continues to be unwilling to work with other nations on peaceful ground and fair relations. As the political powers domestically wrestle over power, relations with the international community continue to be strained and leading the nation down the wrong road. As Chris Hedges wrote, the American empire is coming to an end. The nation has lost the power and respect needed to induce allies in Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Africa to do its bidding. Add the mounting destruction caused by climate change and you have a recipe for an emerging dystopia. Overseeing this descent at the highest levels of the federal and state governments is a motley collection of imbeciles, con artists, thieves, opportunists, and warmongering generals. And to be clear, I include the Democrats. We want peace here at home and across the world. Domestically, the United States has just conducted an election in which the president and many in his leadership have refused to publicly acknowledge these results. This administration has given rise and space to the racist underbelly that many imagined magically disappeared because we had a president that listened to earth, wind and fire and shot hoops in his spare time. Racism continues to be a national pastime of the United States. The summer saw an explosion of protest against the unjust killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor at the hands of racist police. People all over the world flooded the streets in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and to protest state sanctioned violence. The United States has never appeared to be more dysfunctional and disjointed than it is now, and its only concern should be correcting its own issues. With the crumbling infrastructure, a failing for-profit healthcare system, deep structural racism, and severe economic inequality, the United States needs to more now than ever before focus all of its energy at home. First, in creating economic opportunities for its citizens by adopting more socially democratic policies that ensure the most vulnerable citizens have protections. In the words of the late great Dr. James Cone, one's poverty should not be the last say so about one's humanity. Second, the United States should seek to become a peaceful member of the international community once and for all. It must move beyond the imperial lust and attitudes that caused the illegal invasion of Iraq. These attitudes persist as the US continues to threaten global peace and security with militarism and childish posture. Lastly, the United States should use the pending climate crisis to show the world it is ready to build toward a shared future on common ground. No greater issue faces the global community like that of climate change. 
it's the one thing we can't afford to be idealized around or harbor outdated colonial attitudes when addressing. We want peace. We want justice. We stand against the new Cold War. There is nothing to be gained and too much to lose in a Cold War reality. At this moment in history, all nations should be fighting to stop the spread of COVID, working together to take on climate changes and have clear and concise plans on how to best serve the needs of its citizens now and into the future. This is the path of peace. This is the path of justice. And these are the sentiments the peoples of the planet strive for and aim to achieve. It's time to recognize that we are all interconnected and a shared future is the only way forward. In peace. In peace. Uh, first of all, I. Great. So thank you to David West for contributing that pre recorded statement. Our next speaker is Rania Khalik, who is a Lebanese American journalist and a producer, writer, and host at Soapbox, as well as the co host of the podcast Unauthorized Disclosure. She has written and edited work for important left anti war platforms, including Electronic Intifada, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Truth out and more. I know I have benefited from her sharp insights into Lebanon, Syria, and the humanitarian crisis of Yemen. And she has been kind enough to contribute a pre recorded statement. So we will listen to that now. This new Cold War 2.0 that we have happening between the U.S. and China is all part of this great power competition. And it all comes down to the fact that China is a challenge to both U.S. unilateralism and U.S. economic domination around the globe. So this is like what empires do. And of course, for the U.S., it's all in the name of freedom. But I think one of the central aspects to understand about this new Cold War against China is that a lot of it has to do with technology because China is at the forefront of 5G. Um, Huawei is the world's leading provider of networking equipment. Its smartphone is the best seller outside the U.S. and European countries. We're considering Huawei-based infrastructure for their 5G wireless networks. And um, I mean, whoever controls the future of communication kind of controls the future. So this is a huge threat to the U.S. because China's way ahead of the U.S. and will likely be the world leader in 5G technology, which would be a huge economic and technological loss for the U.S. and its companies. So this is one of the reasons you keep hearing this accusation from the U.S. about intellectual property theft. It's really just about the fact that Chinese companies like Huawei have been able to um, go beyond what the U.S. can do in this technology. So that's why you hear people like, my, you know, from the right to the left, or to the, I'm sorry, from Republicans to Democrats, from Elizabeth Warren to Mike Pompeo, consistently accusing China and its companies of stealing from American companies. It's just not true. It's just like political expediency to explain away why the U.S. is behind in this technology. Um, and it's also a way this whole like idea of blaming China and saying intellectual property theft is also a way to garner support from American workers by scapegoating China um, for jobs being shipped overseas instead of blaming the actual culprit, which is capitalism and big corporations lobbying for corporate friendly anti-labor trade deals that move American jobs to countries where labor is cheaper. So these accusations of intellectual property theft and of like China stealing our jobs that you hear again from Republicans and Democrats and that you're gonna start hearing more and more is all ultimately a part of America's defense strategy or I should say military strategy. There was even a recent paper for the Pentagon that said the U.S. should advocate for aggressive protection of U.S. technology, intellectual property rights, in an effort to slow down China's telecommunications ecosystem expansion. That is a direct quote. So this is literally a part of like Pentagon strategy. So what's really happening is that China's own industries are powerful enough that they're starting to challenge their foreign Western counterparts. So the U.S. is whining about this big, bad, menacing Chinese yellow peril because China may have pulled ahead of American tech giants in wireless technology. And then another reason that the U.S. is becoming so vehemently anti-China is ramping up this Cold War also has to do with the fact that China is starting to create new financial infrastructure to get around the US dollar, which is the world reserve currency. So basically China's creating mechanisms that can undermine the US government's 
traditional methods of control and coercion. And that's like a huge red flag, a huge no for like the US empire. So the US isn't gonna tolerate this kind of challenge to its economic dominance, which is why you see again, this unified bipartisanship against China from both Democrats and Republicans with Democrats trying to out hog Trump. And I think one of the most important things to understand also about why the US sees China as such a huge threat on top of this sort of economic side of things is also the ideology. China is offering an alternative model to US neoliberalism, particularly for developing countries. They were able to pull all these people out of poverty in China with their economic model, their like centralized you know, planned economy um, and develop their middle class and take care of people um, while still making themselves cr a crucial part of the global economy. Like China's crucial to, to the way the world economy functions. And so by just merely offering an alternative, that's enough to challenge US hegemony and US empire. Uh, because China can go around and, you know, create these business partnerships with other countries where they don't have these neoliberal you know, strings attached, these conditions attached like the US. That's why you see the US running around the world, you know, threatening even their own allies. Like if you do business with China, we're gonna take, you know, things away from you. And then lastly, I'll add that China is also a useful excuse for the military industrial complex to continue giving, you know, uh, justifications for why they need to expand. Um, you know, you, you need like this constant boogeyman to keep making money. <laughs> and China's the new boogeyman to justify this bloated military budget. And I think it's interesting because chi like one of the reasons you're also seeing this Cold War with China ramp up, it was already happening, but I think COVID kind of accelerated it because COVID accelerated America's decline. I mean, you also saw between the way America handled COVID and the way China handled it, you saw two very different styles of governing and the way they work in the in a global pandemic and the u.s system failed and is failing like in a devastating and embarrassing way on the world stage whereas china was able to control this virus and was actually able to kind of keep its economy moving um so i think that's also you know, demonstrated to the world uh, in many ways, like an example of how the US system is a failure and China could actually offer something that works. And this is like, uh, you know, it, it, this is also, I mean, I think it speaks very badly for capitalism. Um, so, you know, what it comes down to is the fact that, you know, the US wants to maintain a global economic dominance. That's why they're so obsessed with this technology war over 5G and China's at the center of that. And the US wants to maintain this unilateral system of control over the world. And China also challenges that because they're this growing economy that again, offers this sort of alternative um, way of development, particularly for third world countries what's the US gonna be doing down the line is they're gonna be using these issues like Hong Kong and Xinjiang to, to attack China. These sort of, the, what the US always does, they always go after their adversaries by trying to play the human rights card. And so I think it's very important that people always look to these issues with a skeptical eye and really ask questions about the way the media is reporting on these kinds of places because the propaganda war against China for all the reasons I explained, is gonna heat up pretty dramatically and it's gonna make what we saw in Syria uh, look like child's play. Um, so people need to be prepared for that because the US is funding opposition groups that wanna basically uh, you know, cut China up into pieces. Um, and so far the media is following suit without asking questions at all and just playing stenographer for the Pentagon and for the State Department. And we're gonna see more of that under a Biden administration. Thank you again so much, Rania, for uh, your pre-recorded statement. Our next speaker is Chris Matlako. Chris Matlako is the second deputy general secretary of the South African Communist Party and general coordinator of the South African Peace Initiative who has commented extensively on China-African relations. He was kind enough to join us for the No Cold War International Peace Forum in September, where he delivered an important speech critiquing US and European efforts to demonize Chinese-African cooperation as a tactic to ensure their own neo-colonial dominance over the continents. We are so glad to welcome him back for what I'm sure will be another rousing talk. The 
No, thank you very much, Sean. Um, and also just to acknowledge the contributions that have been made before us uh, by the panelists uh, and the very important points that have been made. Uh, I think um, the basis has been laid for understanding where we are today. What I think uh, we should be doing in this brief moment is just to tap in into the South African experience. Um, I mean, you will know that um, the apartheid South Africa was based on a legislated um, regime of racism in our country, which also had its backdrop uh, as British colonialism. So there was there was um, the symbiotic relationship between British colonialism and apartheid in South Africa that actually contributed in, 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 in a significant way to the exploitation uh, and the racism that uh, enveloped South Africa for the long period of time uh, until 1994, uh, when South Africa realized its uh, independence. <clears throat> you also know that the party South Africa was a global pariah and an outcast. Um, at the same time, it received support from the capitalist world, which included the United States and Western Europe, Australia and Japan. But the peoples of the world actually identified with the anti-apartheid struggle. And that's how the anti-apartheid movement actually gained traction in many capitals of the world, in many countries, in many cities and towns, villages of the world. The progressive people of the world understood that racism was indeed a regressive policy and that it was a crime against humanity. The United Nations later he adopted uh, the foundation that said uh, the apartheid was a crime against humanity. Um, we're laying the basis to better understand the reason why we are part of this global movement uh, to fight racism and its connections uh, with capitalism and its connections uh, with imperialism. <clears throat> Um, Zionism in Israel has, in the recent uh, period, also created the foundations through legislation and institutionalizing apartheid uh, in its dealings um, uh, with the Palestinian people and taking land away from the Palestinian uh, people. <clears throat> and like apartheid, uh, Zionist Israel is also supported uh, by the United States uh, and the majority of the capitalist world uh, that seeks to benefit <clears throat> uh, from the system of capitalism as such. <clears throat> in recent years, there has been a rise in what we call uh, right-wing conservatism across the world. And this right-wing conservatism is also connected, we want to argue, with the crisis of capitalism. And the crisis of capitalism has reproduced these conservative views, whether it is migration in Europe, whether it is uh, the resurgence of a more crude racism in other parts of the world against people of uh, Asian origin, against black people, and against Africans uh, generally. All of these things are linked, we want to argue, to the deep crisis of capitalism and as it manifests in the current uh, world today. But the world has not been static with the rise of China on one hand and also its uh, engagements with Africa on a different level with the emergence of BRICS as a platform that holds the potential for being a multilateral uh, platform, um, but also the provision of alternatives uh, for countries of the South. All of these things are seeking to point to a potential that could uh, be useful for us to look at uh, in terms of taking forward a progressive agenda for the world. <clears throat> we also want to argue that um, it will be worth our while to look at the experience of the anti movement and how the anti movement tackled the issues of racism. We're pointing this out because we think it's important for us to build a global network of anti-racism and anti-war across the many fractions and across the many shades of political and other uh, ideological uh, underpinnings. That the anti-apartheid movement with its legacy of having 
mobilized the broad majority of the global progressives and showed that by 1994, South Africa was able to realize uh, its independence. And those positives can uh, be extracted from the anti-apartheid movement um, and we should be able to connect the networks and build on those networks uh, in a global way and build on the progressive ideas uh, and values uh, that are there in society uh, for us to take them forward. One such thing that we think we should be talking about and building uh, a big narrative around is a collaborative effort between China and Cuba around a possible vaccine for COVID-19. That collaboration between China and Cuba will, we want to argue, assist us to overcome and also circumvent the issues that uh, intellectual property, uh, the World Trade Organizations and others, which are instruments that uh, capitalism has put in place in order to continue to tie profit maximization to any scientific development uh, that accrues uh, to society. And we think uh, this effort between Cuba and China is very important and uh, we should be building a huge narrative to support it uh, and encourage other such uh, endeavors to take place uh, across a whole range of things, uh, including efforts of building people-to-people uh, -people relations, exchanges, and other things that would encourage the kinds of things that uh, uh, Lee was talking about earlier, you know, cultural uh, appreciation uh, and the different uh, important aspects that would ensure that we don't see people for their differences, but we see people for who they are as humanity, and therefore we're able to bring on that. That's why our slogan, uh, as a South African Communist Party and also as progressives who support genuine peace uh, on the continent, is socialism is the future, build it now. And we want to thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, on these issues. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Chris McFlacco. Our next, our next speaker is Lacey Ohin, who is a longtime international activist for over 40 years. He is the national coordinator of China's U.S. Solidarity Network, which in 2017 launched the first of its kind exchange between activists from both nations in a program of bilateral solidarity and political education. He is also the national coordinator of National Immigrant Solidarity Network, as well as having had quite a distinguished and global career as a reporter. Seo Hin Sin Sun, give it to you. Try again. Thank you. Uh, I'm work right now working between US and China. Probably I'm the uh, only person here that has been traveled between China and the US this year. I'm working on the medical field. Before I was in an uh, uh, undocumented sweatshop worker for several decades in the US. And I've been, uh, of course, I've been in the oppressed racist society that has been oppressed for many, many years that understand that racisms and imperialisms are uh, all come together. So it's a, uh, this year the, the, the virus is not just only is talking about the, the, uh, the big health crisis, but it has been leading to, has been US has been doing, launching a decades of Cold War pre preparing from since 2008, 2010, against China from uh, the so-called uh, labor issues to sweatshops to uh, Xinjiang, Tibet. So this is just a, has been an increment the part of the, uh, the US campaign against China. The same thing has been uh, the anti-immigrant movement and hysteria and xenophobia in the US has been increased specifically after the election of the Donald Trump on 2016. But the, let's say that since last year, when the China-US Troy war heating up, and then the Hong Kong also has been uh, the, on the middle of the, the, the violent fascist riots who had been backed by the US, that has been the people has been worried about 
what will happen to China. Is it a time that U.S. under the Trump administration launching a new Cold War that can be overrun China, plus the, the so-called Xinjiang independent movement? It was uh, until it would peak, the situation become the worst on December that when China in the, that moment able to fight back against US aggression from Hong Kong that the riots able to stop. The Xinjiang never had anything happened and the US lost the trade war on last December that China won all this front. And US, the elite and the Trump administration from left, not just Trump, but also from the left Democrats to right wing, far right, are furious, furious that China won. That's the reason they are desperately looking for an event, an incident they can turn the table back. What happened on the January, the virus pandemic start from, similarly start from uh, Wuhan, but there's no, no specific proof that this originated from Wuhan, that become a magnet of racism and opportunity for US launching global effort to against China and hopefully isolate China. And uh, that would, at the end, US will win the so-called new Cold War they want to launch, the racist Cold War. And that they thought that the China cannot control the virus and then the, the death will be astronomical and the economy will collapse, collapse and then the Chinese citizen will maybe turn again, angry against the government for failing to control the virus, the pandemic. And at the end, China was successfully, successfully contained the virus within two to three months. And now everything going back to normal. This year, I, I was in China early this year organizing a delegation from US and UK activists from around the world to China to support the Chinese activist society uh, community as well as understand the situation in China. That was right before the, uh, uh, the COVID. And we went to Xinjiang and met with officials and met with our community activists that what we can do to support China. And then at the end of the delegation that uh, uh, on the January, then the, uh, then the, uh, the, the so-called COVID was started. And I left China in the middle of the January and coming back to US. And then from March, the US, the, the pandemic became our control. That's then now everyone know the US has become the worst COVID crisis in the world. Why? That you can you can do a comparison between US and China. Why China can successfully contain the virus and why US cannot and become a miserable failure and then with hundred with tens, hundreds of thousands of people died, killed, and 200,000 people died. Why? There's a, there's a failure of the US imperialism that only focusing on racism, focusing on military imperialism, spending all the money on the capitalism that do not care about the people. That not in, not that in China, that money spent on the community, spent on the people. That's how actually the, they, the Chinese government able to fought against the wind virus and fight within less than three months.
And now in China, so everything uh, back to the normal, uh, back to, uh, from the community to the business and all these things. I'm still in, uh, I'm coming back to China on August to continue my community work and continue my uh, different kind of activism work. And, of, and I have been talking to people to building a solidarity between US and China. And hopefully we can build a community-based work. And so far, the people in, in China are really neck, of course, I mean, uh, uh, American public and then also uh, UK has been a really, really negative about China, the so-called the virus and the so-called all these uh, uh, lies about all this, uh, what happened in China. So they don't understand what happened in China. And Chinese community activists uh, to general publics has also have a very negative view about U.S. imperialism, and they do do not believe after the election, even the Biden's win the elections, that will be fundamentally change because there's no difference between the far right fascist Trumps or the so-called liberal left Democratic. Biden administration, the imperialism is still the same. Their exploitations may be a little different, but they're still the same. They're serving the multinational corporation. Their policy is still the same. What I want to say in general is the why I've been in China, I've been when I went back to US, I can try to convince a community across the country to how to work with China and uh, uh, to dialogue with Chinese activists. Right now I'm in China, I do the same. I call, talking to the community and uh, community activists and academia to how to build a solidarity with the US and UK and uh, uh, activists from across the world. That's a real urgent need to be a community activists can work together. Sometimes the problem is that we are back in the long tree. We are not finding the right people to work or talk together. That's a really uh, 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 troubling to me. And we should find a more ground like this kind of communication. But also, I think that will be highly recommended. We also should be doing a, a, a bilingual, uh, just like in US, uh, uh, that everyone know that if you're an immigrant activist, you got if you're especially if you're serving the uh, uh, the Latino community, you got to have English and Spanish bilingual. That's a common sense. If we are talking about China solidarity, we should bring more Chinese activists, Chinese speaking activists, and then resolve how to do the uh, translations. Because many Chinese activists in China also talk about US and then that they have a really good point of view. They want to dialogue with community activists uh, from a US and peace activists around the world, but we need to build this channel. Another thing is uh, we also wrote a book recently with a couple of community activists called uh, in US called uh, Capitalism Ventilator. There's a first, this kind of books about COVID uh, uh, fighting between uh, China and the US and how, why China won the uh, COVID fight, why US failed the COVID fight. And the book was banned two weeks ago in Amazon. So we're now launching a campaign and we do the, uh, we print the book by ourselves and hope that's such hope that can people can read it. But on the same time that in the US, doesn't matter from left to right, from uh, tech savvy gigs to uh, uh, internet company to uh, uh, to QAnon conspiracy theorists, they do not want to listen to the truth. They do not want to hear the uh, voice, at least voice from the other people in listenable way. We need to build a better communication channel. And we also need to make our voice loud and clear to everyone about what we stand for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our last speaker, but certainly not the least, Nick Estes is a citizen of the Kul Wachasa Oyate, known in English as the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, an assistant professor in the American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico, and a co-founder of the Red Nation, a revolutionary organization dedicated to the liberation of native peoples from capitalism and colonialism, and which runs a favorite podcast of mine. Nick, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, there's something about the weather. Last year, bushfires in Australia scorched 46 million acres, an area larger than Hungary and Portugal combined. 
Flames shot nearly half a mile in the air, killing 30, 34 humans and more than 1 billion animals. And in the United States this year, uh, 8.2 million acres burned, killing 37 people and displacing countless others. Swarms of locusts uh, darken the sky in parts of East Africa and West Asia, devouring plants and fruits as they tore through the land, leaving hardly a scrap of green. In a single living swarm in Kenya amassed to a size three times larger than New York City, tens of millions faced increased uh, food security, insecurity, and hunger. But the horsemen of the apocalypse can't ride without a plague. The coronavirus pandemic swept the globe, sharpening two competing visions of humanity, one based on the science and caretaking, and the other on pure make-believe. The most powerful nation in the world chose the latter. And, the United, and across the United States, black, brown, indigenous, migrant, and poor people in general have bore the brunt of the virus. Even tepid social reforms like universal health care, largely a reality for most nations of the global north, was off the table. Instead, hundreds of thousands of people needlessly died, oftentimes alone without access to life-saving medications or treatment available to the super rich. A large part of humanity perished, taking a little piece of our heart um, with them. Others who either survived the virus symptoms or had lost their jobs or all three were left to fend for themselves as billionaires raked in record earnings. In places like the Navajo Nation, which is not far from where I'm calling, rates of infection uh, were exa are, are exacerbated by centuries of resource colonialism. While its rivers have been diverted to water golf courses in Phoenix, Arizona, and its mesas mined for coal to power the Southwest, about 30% of its population lives without running water and 10% live without electricity. Navajo grandmothers who have hauled water for 90 years of their lives next to fracking rigs uh, that pump millions of gallons of water, of fresh water into the ground to crack it open during the fracking process, which both pollutes the land and the water. This is in a desert landscape where water is especially uh, scarce. In Indian country, tribes that took serious the science closed their borders and set up emergency health protections. Yet the make-believe make approach won over many. And once it was revealed in the media that the virus disproportionately impacted non-white communities, heavily armed men, mostly uh, most of whom were white, stormed state capitals demanding haircuts and the reopening of restaurants. The virus intensified and, and spread, and with it came a toxic atmosphere of cynicism and hatred. Coronavirus is like climate change. The most advanced capitalist countries were warned about the threats far in advance. They had access to the best science and experts and did nothing. U.S. officials cynically renamed fossil fuels emitted into the atmosphere molecules of U.S. freedom. And U.S. leaders blamed the coronavirus massive body count not on an inhumane for-profit healthcare system, but on a foreign country. China, because of its socialized uh, healthcare system, which is similar in Cuba and Vietnam, they swiftly and all but eliminated the threat of the virus within a matter of months as it continued to spread elsewhere. And despite the massive death and destruction, a viable alternative within the mainstream North American politics didn't coalesce, and 2020 is on track to be the hottest year uh, on record. And this, is, this flies in the face of you know, uh, the fact that the current administration and the incoming administration have no real plan for addressing climate change, uh, let alone addressing the coronavirus, in spite of you know, China's pledge to become carbon neutral by 2060. Um, and so I think some of the other speakers have mentioned uh, previously that what is at stake here is not simply uh, racism on a domestic scale, um, but the real threat to an alternative or the real threat to neoliberalism and the alternative um, of, of the current global order that's dominated by the United States. And we can look no further than Bolivia and understand that the recent coup that happened last year uh, against Evo Morales and the movement towards socialism uh, was, was recently overturned. Um, so Evo Morales has returned back to the country and with him in the election of Luis Arce as president and David Chicohuenca as vice president, the indigenous revolution continues. And not only had the coup, the coup government with the support of the United States overthrown the administration, they also tried to crush the project of, uh, for decolonization it represented. And this is specifically relates to the path of resource nationalism that Bolivia took 
specifically in, in nationalizing its, its lithium reserves, which as everyone knows is a key ingredient for rechargeable batteries, um, which is necessary for any kind of post carbon future um, that we may want to live in. Uh, and as an organization, the Red Nation, we take inspiration from Bolivia and the 2010 People's Accords that were drafted in Cochabamba, Bolivia, um, a, lar a large part of the Proceso de Cambio, the process of change. The accords themselves spell out principles of eco-feminism, eco-socialism, and anti-imperialism infused with traditional indigenous ecological knowledge. And that's the spirit uh, in which we operate in uh, and understanding that not only does uh, climate justice have to be uh, focused on uh, decolonization, but it also has to be focused on anti-imperialism. And, and for the, the sake of this specific talk, I think it's important to talk about the role that US militarism has played in places like the Pacific, uh, specifically uh, ramping up aggression towards uh, China. So after the 19th century, the US military industrial complex developed an unprecedented uh, at an unprecedented rate on stolen lands in occupied Hawaii. In the early 1900s, the US military established infrastructure dedica dedicated to coastal defense and infantry uh, with various forts, you know, named after various uh, generals of the United States. Um, in the 1930s, Air, for Air Force or airfields were built. Uh, and after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the United States tightened its military grip by instituting martial law, erecting concentration camps, and increasing recruitment of Japanese Americans to be deployed in World War II. The Cold War subsequently ushered in more military expenditures to Hawaii, like the creation of the Barking Sands Missile Facility on the island of Kauai. For the first time in the 1940s, US military spending became the largest source of revenue in the islands. So reports from 2008 suggested across Hawaiian islands, the collective military forces of the United States maintained 21 uh, military installations, 26 housing complexes, eight training areas, and 19 bases of operating stations. Armed forces, military dependents, and veterans make up uh, more than 16% of Hawaii's entire population. And some estimate that that could be upwards to 20%. Estimates uh, from 2013 indicated that the military controls more than 230,000 acres of land in Hawaii. And on the island of Oahu, about 94,000 acres are controlled by the military, which makes up approximately 25% of the whole island. Re uh, recent reports show US military spending in Hawaii was about 8.8 uh, billion, and I think that's increased um, to around uh, close to 10 billion, uh, which ranked <clears throat> A second only to the four, uh, fourteen point seven billion dollars that tourists spend in in the in the in the island alone. So a key example of how U.S. Uh, employs militarization to justify its illegal occupation of the island is RIMPAC, occurring once every two years in Hawaii, and it occurred this year uh, in August around its water. The the rim of the Pacific war games are hosted by the U.S. Pacific Fleet, Fleet which is a subordinate command of PACOM the US uh, Pacific Command. Headquartered in Hawaii, PACOM uh, held 300,000 military personnel, which was about 20% of the total US active duty military force. But as the, their official website states, this number has increased to around 360,000 and, and it's responsible for policing approximately half uh, the Earth's surface. PACOM's mission is to protect, you know, according to its, its definition, is to protect and defend in concert with other US government agencies, the territory of the United States, its people and interests with allies and partners, PACOM is committed to enhancing stability in the Asia Pacific region by promoting security cooperation, encouraging peaceful development, responding to contingencies, deterring aggression, and when necessary, fighting to win. And this is a, that's the quote from its, its stated uh, mission. So starting in 1971, RIMPAC is the, is the world's oldest or uh, world's largest multinational maritime training exercise in which the US Navy invites militaries to participate from nations all over the world. It is as Kanaka Maoli scholar and activist Hawane K. Trask said, the Hawley or the foreign war machine, including nuclear submarines and missiles is well oiled and ready for deployment on a moment's notice. Hawaii, like most of the Pacific is a nuclearized paradise. And I think it's important to understand that the origins of the Cold War, uh, the old Cold War 
um, originate in nuclear imperialism. And I live in a place in New Mexico where the atomic bomb was not only invented and tested for the first time, but it was also here where uranium was mined and refined uh, and also tested upon um, the local indigenous population. That project, you know, led to the global kind of supremacy of the United States, having uh, been the only nation in the world to ever use uh, that bomb against, you know, in a wartime scenario against another civilian population. It should be, it should be also noted that the effects of radiation and the continued fallout from the nuclear weapons industry in places like New Mexico has been impacting indigenous people and also non-indigenous people as well. So there isn't, there isn't just military targets within this kind of nuclear uh, uh, complex that has developed. And we can, we can see that within the militarization of the Pacific itself, it's centering and pivoting, you know, as Obama said, towards uh, China. And that this is just a continuation of the, of the Indian wars that the United States fought on the Western frontier um, that was extended to the Pacific, as we can see with the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingo, kingdom in the 19th century and the militarization of Hawaii as a, uh, as a site for US hegemony and continued military exercises. And with that in mind, I think it's important to understand that this current administration has a has a you know has a mandate um, to uh, begin a, a green transition, and a lot of that that money, as we know of uh, you know as people who have experienced um, U.S. military aggression, um, we know a lot of that money is going to go directly towards military ex expenditures. Uh, and in fact, it's it's important to remember that the U.S. military itself is one of the largest polluters. On, on the planet. Uh, and a lot of that comes from, it's more than 800 military installations around the world, uh, which is an expansive and expensive carbon footprint, not only in dollar terms, but in the fact that the United States has uh, almost single-handedly with uh, the North Atlantic powers colonized the atmosphere as some of the other um, uh, panelists have pointed out the, the 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 carbon emissions from China actually go towards producing goods that are going to be consumed in the first world, especially in the United States. So that in that carbon footprint is more so ours than anyone else's. Um, and the fact of the matter is, the U.S. military is deeply intertwined with the the fossil fuel industry uh, and the the you know the history of fighting wars for oil. Um, but then also the kind of global sanctions campaign that the United States is almost unilaterally pushing against oil producing nations such as Venezuela uh, and Iran. Uh, and in, in a kind of in to kind of wrap it up and to think about where uh, indigenous people and decolonization movements play an important role in advocating for peace um, in this moment is thinking about the current land back movement in places like the United States and Canada where indigenous people are attempting to reclaim land uh, and attempting to build a economies that are based around their needs and not for profit. Um, so the focus on land is not just within uh, the, the so-called domestic territory of the United States. Uh, indigenous activists have also been calling for demilitarization. And that means land back to nations and territories occupied by more than the 800 overseas US military bases that violate the sovereignty of the nations or threaten the sovereignty of the nations in, ter in terms of uh, China. This includes places like Guantanamo Bay, which must be restored back to Cuba, Okinawa, Korea, Guam, Hawaii, the Philippines, Iraq, Egypt, Afghanistan, Puerto Rico, El Salvador, Honduras, Panama, and so many other places the US occupies. And through, so through, if we don't do something now, the United States, even under the Biden administration, is going to continue the project of militarizing the globe. Uh, and the United States holds the future of the planet hostage, not only in terms of how we understand US military aggression, but how we as, as, a, as humanity can combat climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And let me take a moment again to express how much of it is a privilege for me to host such a panel of extraordinary speakers today. It definitely lived up to my expectations, exceeded them rather. And I'm very happy that uh, I was able to be a small part of this today. And with that, um, I'm actually going to hand it off to Carlos Martinez, who's one of the senior uh, conveners of the No Cold War International Campaign for the closing words. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, and I want to thank all the panelists today for their insights. I think it's been 
a hugely uh, interesting and, and insightful event. Um, as Sean said, my name is Carlos Martinez. I'm part of the No Cold War organizing group. And I just wanted to wrap up the session by saying something about why we organized this event, why we thought it was important to join together these two themes of racism and the new Cold War. Um, and the basis of it is really that capitalism is in turmoil, specifically neoliberal capitalism is in turmoil. Ongoing economic stagnation alongside the startling failure this year of the major Western economies to, to contain the coronavirus pandemic is producing essentially a crisis of legitimacy and a corresponding sense of panic among the ruling class. The US is the leading uh, capitalist power and it's the worst affected. You know, for the moment, it remains the, the world's largest economy in GDP terms, or, albeit not for very long, but its quality of life indicators are deteriorating. Poverty is rising. Infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, large parts of the country are affected by chronic unemployment. COVID-19 has to date taken the lives of almost a quarter of a million people in that country, and that number is going up by around a thousand every single day. And economic crisis has always gone hand in hand with social crisis because a decline in people's living standards leads them to ask certain questions about why um, their living standards are in decline. And in response, capitalist governments have always tried to find ways to do two things, to restore profitability, to get the economy back on track, and at the same time to maintain uh, a status quo, to maintain social stability. In Britain and the US, we're still kind of reeling from the financial crash of 2008. Uh, we, you know, we're still in an economic recession that starts at that time. Um, and the ruling classes have responded to that crash with, on the one hand, bailouts for the rich, bailouts for the banks, and for the poor, it's been a story of relentless and brutal austerity. In both cases, they've attempted to divert and weaken working class resistance through the promotion specifically of racism, um, especially at this time, xenophobia, you know, anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim Islamophobic racism. And then in parallel to this, at a geostrategic level, the West response to the crisis is really around the new Cold War on China. China's rose, rise poses a very difficult problem for the US and for the, for the world system that it leads. The US just doesn't know how to deal with the rise of China. China will certainly overtake the US as the world's largest economy within the next few years. It's already ahead in several important areas of technology and it's catching up fast in others. What's more, politically, China is an independent country. It's a, it's a third world power, unlike Europe, unlike Japan, unlike the so-called five eyes, uh, so-called five eyes countries, China can't be told what to do. It doesn't have a particular stake in the U.S.-led system, the the so-called post-war post-war liberal order. And as a developing country, China is pushing for an end to hegemony, for a multipolar, multilateral world in which the sovereignty of all countries is respected. As a non-white power that has constructed its own path to progress and prosperity, China's helping to destroy the ideology of white supremacy that's been so intimately bound up with the imperialist world system for literally hundreds of years. As a socialist oriented country with you know, no less a communist party government and an essentially planned economy, China's dismantling the kind of established, the received wisdom, the Western free market liberalism is the perfect way to organize society. Uh, you know, Francis Fukuyama said, uh, would have been nearly 30 years ago now that we'd reached the end of history with modern liberal capitalism. I think you know, if you were to ask him today, he'd have to take those words back because we very clearly haven't seen the end of history. But this is the context to the new Cold War. This is the reason for the so-called pivot to Asia, the trade war, the propaganda war, the decoupling, the, uh, the attacks on Chinese technology companies, the attempts to diplomatically isolate China, the fomenting of anti-Chinese racism, the strategy of military encirclement. And the, all this is happening at the same time as a worrying rise in racism is no coincidence. As I've said, both are manifestations of neoliberal capitalism in crisis. Both are being deployed in an attempt to preserve a system which is based on the needs of a wealthy elite at the expense of the vast majority of humanity. 
And that's why we think that both need to be resolutely opposed by all of us, by all of those that want to see a different type of world, a world characterized by peace, by cooperation, by freedom from all forms of racial or national oppression. Um, so with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning into today's webinar. It's been a really inspiring, a really educational event. We hope that everybody will go onto our website, www.nocoldwar.org and sign our statement which is called a new Cold War against China is against the interests of humanity um, and will campaign around it. I think nearly all of the speakers today have already signed the statement. Signatories include Diane Abbott, Ajamu Baraka, Medea Benjamin from Code Pink, Professor Gerald Horn, Martin Jakes, the author, Irvin Jim, Chris Matlaco, John Pilger, Alfonso Perez Esquivel, and Ram uh, Carlos Ron from the Venezuelan government, Jill Stein, Yanis Varoufakis, Zhang Weiwei. Um, so we very much hope that you will join those people in signing our statement. Um, this has been our last event for 2020. It's been a very busy few months since we launched. We launched in July um, with, our, with our initial conference. We had an in international peace forum in September. In October, we had a dialogue between professors Jeffrey Sachs and Zhang Weiwei. Last week, we had an event um, in conjunction with the Chongyang Institute and the Tricontinental Institute um, around the US elections. And now this we've got today's event. So it's been a busy half year, busy few months. You can see all of this material, by the way, on our YouTube channel, the name for which is No Cold War. We're gonna have many more events in 2021. We very much hope that you will continue to participate and to support this work. We've got a newsletter and a mailing list, which you can also sign up to on the website. And we hope to see you again. Thank you very much.